<laughs> Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us here together, the fellowship, the chance to learn from your word. Lord, I ask that you would open our ears and our eyes that we could see and hear. For we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So today, Father, we look forward to our faith being greatly built up. We know that you will send out your word and it will not return to you void. Your word. We thank you, Father. We ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to Come Up Here in Ministry. Uh, the end from the beginning. Uh, last week we talked about the uh, dispensations. There are seven dispensations or ages that we go through in the Bible. Hebrews 1 1 and 2. It says, God, who at different time periods and in various ways spoke in times past unto the Jewish prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir to all things, by whom also he made the world. The first dispensation that we have is the dispensation of innocence. This is when God created the world, created man, uh, it began right after creation, uh, after Adam was on the scene. Uh, the age of innocence, of course, wasn't around before that because there wasn't any need. <laughs> but uh, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, that dispensation came to an end. The next dispensation is the dispensation of conscience. Now, in this dispensation, Man did whatever he thought was right. And God saw that everything, every intent in man's heart was evil. So he knew he had to do something because he needed a clean bloodline for Christ. He had already planned from the beginning what he had to do. So this began after the fall of Adam and ended with the flood in Noah's day. Now one thing I want to point out is you know, people don't think a whole lot about uh, what was transpiring before the flood. At that point, the, the Bible calls it the sons of God, with the, the small g. Basically, the fallen angels saw the women and thought they were lovely and decided to come down and, and lay with them, have sex. They had children. Those children were known as Nephilim, half-angel or half demon, half human. Those were the giants in the land. When you read the Bible, it talks about giants. That's what it's referring to. Every bloodline in the world was corrupt one way or another with the blood of the Nephilim. God needed a clean line for Jesus Christ, and there was only one man that had a clean line still, and that was Noah. The Bible says he was found to be righteous. Not really anything with what he did, but more of what he believed is why he was considered righteous. After the flood, we have the dispensation of human government. And this one is where God allowed man to rule himself, basically, try out a different way. And it began right after the flood of Noah's day, and it ended at the Tower of Babel. A man erected the tower because he wanted to try to get to God, but not just get to God, but to show him to be as though he was as big as God. At this point, there was only one race on the earth. Even though after the flood, God had told Noah and his children to multiply, basically take over the earth again, he wanted them to go out. They all stayed in one area. Because they all spoke one language, there was nothing they could not do, and God knew this. So the only thing he could do was to come and scramble their languages and force man into different races. After that is the dispensation of promise. This began with the destruction of the Tower of Babel, and in it is the Abrahamic covenant, which is given during this dispensation, and it lasted until the children of Israel went, Israel went into captivity in Egypt. It ended after Israel was released from captivity in Egypt. And one thing I want to point out is between each dispensation, there's always a transition time, a, a, a small window, I guess you could say, where basically it's like God is resetting everything. 
In each dispensation, God starts it. It starts out perfect, it starts out the way it's supposed to be, and each dispensation ends with man's failure, man's sin. After the promise came the dispensation of the law. That began after the children of Israel were released from captivity in Egypt. They went to Mount Sinai. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments to give to Israel. Basically, it was to show that man just can't keep the law. Uh, even after Christ came, and the new Jewish believers who had accepted Christ and knew that Christ did what he did for them, for their salvation, they kept trying to go back to the Mosaic Law. Go back to what neither they nor their fathers could do. Uh, in fact, uh, Peter rebuked them and said in Acts 15.10, Now therefore, why tempt ye to God to put a yoke, the law, upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But since Jesus took care of everything, he kept the law, he took it out of the way. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, the law, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, I love this, nailing it to the cross. Nailed right there with our sins. Because without the law, there is no sin. The law was there to show us that we couldn't do it. It ended with Jesus at the cross. Now, the next dispensation is the dispensation of grace, or also, as we know it, the church. It began on the day of Pentecost. Not when Jesus died on the cross, the day of Pentecost. And it will end at the rapture of the church. And then after that is one final dispensation or age. That's the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins after the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just when it looks like Satan's won the final victory, the battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ will appear in the clouds with his host, us, his church will all be on white horses and basically even though we're with him we're just set spectators because he's going to handle the whole thing himself he's not even going to get off his horse to do it he's just going to speak Satan and all his demons will be bound for a thousand years now this reign this final reign will end after Jesus reigns for a thousand years and it reigns with in Revelation 21.1 says, Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. The old earth will pass away. When God destroyed the world, destroyed the earth in the flood, He made a covenant with man. He gave us that rainbow. Too many people look at this and say, well, God said he'll never destroy the earth again. That's not what he said. He said, I won't use water. This time he's going to use fire. Going to totally annihilate what we have now. And we'll have a new heaven, a new earth. And that brings us to the dispensation of the mystery. Or, as we know it, the church. Colossians 1, 16 and 18. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In other words, that he be first in everything. I want to point out something here. Um, when you read the Bible, and I'm sure it's what you've been told a lot, you see God created the heavens and the earth. God did not. God spoke it. But Jesus created it. It says right there. All things, not just the earth, 
on all the principalities, the powers, the dominions. He created time. All the dispensations, which is just another fancy name for ages, were created by Jesus. They were framed by him. They have a definite beginning, a definite end. Now, I'm not saying that God um, doesn't have the power. He does, because all three together is one God. But it doesn't contradict it when you hear, you know, that God spoke and said that to be light, and then to say Jesus created it, because you think, well, God spoke it. Well, what is Jesus known as? He's known as the Word. He is the Word of God. So God, the Father, spoke it, and the Word created it. So everything was created by the Word. God the Father is like the architect. Jesus is like the construction supervisor. He makes sure it gets built. The Holy Spirit is like the administrator or facilitator that helps things run smoothly. All three together make one. Ephesians 3 Verses 1 and 2. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me. This word dispensation, when you break it down, you look at it in the Greek, is oikonomios. Oiko, the first part of it, means house. Nomia is leader. So basically it's an administrator, or in this case, administration. It's, a, it's the leader or the law of the house. Um, it's like when the new president comes in to office. The White House doesn't change. The rooms don't change. All the physical things don't change. But the administration changes. The president comes in and says, you're all fired. For the old administration because the old is put away now it's time for the new and so that's the same way with with God His, the way he's dealt with us and man even through all the different periods during the church age he deals with us mainly through grace which is why it's also known as the dispensation of grace that's his focus it doesn't mean that the law that he doesn't have laws doesn't mean that there's no human government. Doesn't mean that we don't have conscience. Every one of these dispensations is really in effect for each one, but each one is where there was a focus. The first one was the focus on innocence. After that, it was the focus on conscience. Now it's the focus on grace. Uh, and a good example for under the uh, dispensation of the law, David and Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba committed a heinous sin, adultery. According to the law that God laid down, they should have been stoned to death. And David even more, because he not only had adulterous affair, he murdered somebody to have this affair and to cover it up. So according to the law, they should have been stoned. But they weren't. Why? Because David confessed his sin. He repented. He turned back to God and said, God, I have sinned against you. Because of that, he found grace in the eyes of God. So grace, even back then, was in operation. It wasn't the main focus. And my personal belief, and I, I just like to think these weird things, go all the way back to Adam and Eve. When Eve gave Adam the apple, and he took it, do you think that's where the sin happened? No. The sin happened when he denied and blamed God for the woman that he gave him. Eve wasn't guilty. God never said she was guilty. If you go talk to, when, when Jesus was talking, and when and the Holy Spirit about Jesus, through one man, he didn't say through a couple, he said through one man, sin entered the world. Through one man, Sin is defeated. So if Eve was really to blame too, then Jesus really should have got married and him and his wife should have saved us. But didn't need to. But I always think, what if instead of Adam saying, God, it's this woman you gave me, what if he said, God, I screwed up. Man, I am so sorry. 
and really meant it, I truly believe we wouldn't be in the mess we are today. But everything knew that Adam wouldn't. What's really funny, not really funny, but shows you how much God loves us, is he knew all this before the foundations of the world. Before the earth was created, when it was still formless, a void, he knew what was going to happen. It's like he had a meeting. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father says, I'm going to create this world with a man in it who is just like us, and they are going to screw it totally up. But I got a plan. We could fix this. But somebody's got to die. And Jesus says, I'll do it. And Father says, you're dead. Let's get it done. From the point that he spoke it, it became a fact. Before you were born, before your parents were born, before Adam was born, were created, God knew us. He knew you. He knew you. He knew me. Not only just knew me, but he knew my name. And he said, i got a plan for you. Now, we don't always follow his plan. The really good thing about our God is he is so forgiving that when we screw up and we go off plan, and he's got a good plan for us, if we just go this way, everything's going to be hunky-dory, it's going to be perfect. But we're men. We're really stupid sometimes. And we say, okay, God, that's a great plan. But you know what? If I go this way, I think it'll be better. And so we go up this hill, and we decide we're going to try this way. And we get just like, God, I screwed up. This is definitely not a better way. And he said, that's no problem. We can still get you back on plan from where you are. The Bible says that the callings and plans of God are without repentance. When you're a child, when you're old, that calling is still there. Whether you acted on it or not. I... I'm fortunate for that because I was called to do this so many, many years ago and I pretty much ignored that call. And then I got to the point where I thought, God, I'm getting kind of old. How could I really fulfill this call? And then it was pointed out to me, Abraham wasn't called till he was 75. I think, cool, I got 15 years on him. <laughs> so, like, I'm going for it. So I dedicated my life and what I'm doing now to God. And I'm going to do what He called me to do, no matter what the world thinks. No matter how they think I'm crazy. Um, it's really funny because since I've started doing this, I've had so many people come to me and say, you know, we always wondered why you didn't do this before. It's like, because I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 3-6. through 6. How that by the revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. See, this word is sprinkled all through the New Testament. Which in other ages was not made known. There was other dispensations. Nobody knew about the church. To the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Um, take a look at that word mystery, and if you look at the Greek, it's really, really close to that word mystery, and it's mysterian. It's, also, it's known as a transliteration because the word is so close. Even though mystery is not what you may think. If I asked you what a mystery is, you would say it's something that's unknown. Not in the New Testament. When it's using the word mysterion, it's something that was not revealed, was unknown in ages past. It's not why God gave all the New Testament, all the, the epistles to Paul and to John and to Jude and Peter to write to us because it's not a mystery. For those before, it was a mystery. In fact, the word mysterion goes way back. It goes back to the oldest form of Greek, the Homeric Greek, which uh, is, I believe, the first version of Greek there is. And it was, actually refers to fraternities. Now, you may think of a fraternity like you do in college. It's, it's a secret society. And that's basically what it is. A little more serious back then, though. Um, 
you know, your colleges have your fraternities and sororities, basically you're sworn to secrecy, you're not supposed to discuss what happens in it. Uh, an example for today of a really big fraternity or uh, secret uh, person is the Masons. Now, the Masons say they draw their lineage all the way back to the time of Solomon and the Stonecutters, but I'll tell you right now that the Masonic Lodge is satanic. It's used by Satan. It's not for God. There may be good people, and I'm sure there are good people in there, but it is not for God. Um, the Bible even talks about it. It goes all the way back to the book of Daniel. When Daniel was captured, taken into Babylon, he was inducted into this fraternity, and basically it's scientists. They, they studied science and math, true astrology, all those things that are just, I mean, these guys were just super wise. That's why Daniel was, was picked for it, because he was extremely smart. God had totally blessed him in that. And the bad thing about it is when their members die, so do their secrets. So this fraternity of wise people that Daniel was in, the astrologers, and I say a true astrology, because Satan has taken what God has done and perverted it. When you think of uh, astrology, you think of Gemini, Cancer, Sagittarius, and you know, you're not supposed to use the stars to look at to try to figure out your own path. But God put those stars up there. He put Sagittarius up there. He put Scorpio up there for a reason. The stars reveal the gospel. When Jesus was born, there was a star over Bethlehem, and wise men, you know, you think of your nativity, you got the wise men at the manger, the shepherds, the animals, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I hate to, to blow your image of that out of the water, but the wise men weren't there. It says in the Bible that when the wise men got there, because they had followed a star from the east, and it took them two years to get there. They were so far out of their normal path, and it wasn't three, because it talks about the entire city of Jerusalem. Basically, sat up and took notice when these guys showed up, and they came to see Herod. And they said to Herod, we come seeking he who is born king of the Jews. Well, now it's very specific why they said born king of the Jews. Herod, because they just said we came seeking the king of the Jews, Herod would have said, here I am. But he was not born king of the Jews. In fact, he wasn't even a Jew. He was an Edomite. He usurped the throne, took it over and tried to get the, the Jews to like him. But he wasn't a Jew, he was an outsider. So many attempts on his life. And so he asked these wise men, he said, when you find him, come back and tell me because I want to worship him too. Well, his idea of worship at time is with a dagger. He wanted to kill him. The wise men went and found Jesus and it says in the Bible that they went to the house where he was. It doesn't say that they went to the manger. And by the way, a manger was just a fancy way of saying cave with some hay in it. Now, yes, that's where he was born. But that's not where he lived. He was two years old. Just imagine the wise men coming up to the door, knocking the door, and here's this two-year-old toddler come running up. And they know him as the king, the Messiah. And see, they knew that this was the Messiah because they read the stars. They followed the stars. They saw the gospel of the stars. They were believers before Jesus went to the cross. They knew who he was. And they didn't just bring a little bit of frankincense, a little bit of myrrh, a little bit of... Uh, Gold. No, they had camel loads. Because there was at least 50, more than likely 100 wise men in that caravan. Three wouldn't draw any attention. But this is the money that basically enabled Jesus and his family to live in Egypt for two years. Yeah, so they weren't paupers. Jesus has never been poor. Even though a lot of people will try to tell you where it says, you know, the, the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Well, yeah, he didn't own a house, but he pretty much owned everything else. He had everything he ever needed when he needed it.
He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In Matthew 13, Jesus talks seven kingdom parables. And he's talking about these parables here. They're mysteries to these people. Because remember, he's talking not just to the disciples, but to all the Jews. And at this point, the church is still a mystery. They don't understand it. But two of those were really great. One was about a treasure. The parable of treasure, which are gems, refers to Israel. And then there was the parable of the pearl of great price. That refers to the church. Now the difference is gems are formed. They're formed in the earth. Uh, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, gold, all those gems are formed. Pearls are built, and they come from the sea. Now there's very good reason why he's doing this from the sea. Uh, when the Bible talks about the sea, it talks about all the other people, all the other nations and kindreds and the tongues are from the sea. You know, from all over. In other words, not just right here. Because what he's going to do is the parable of the treasure. Remember the rich man found a great treasure, buried it, hid it in a field, and went and bought the field. Then a merchant man who found his pearl of great price went and sold everything he had to buy it. The pearl, again, is built. What's it built from? From one little irritating stone. And also remember that Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the pearl, that, that one irritant that's in the oyster, creates the, the pearl, that stone is Jesus Christ. When he went, when he died, crucified, was crucified and died, he went to hell for three days. He was a major irritant to the Satan, the devil, the whole time. And he left there with the keys of the kingdom. So Jesus, who is building our church, his church, started it there. That's the first layer. And then each year, it just gets more on there and more. And it's, he's been working on this pearl for 2,000 years now. And I personally believe that he's about done. And how do you get pearls out of the oysters? You have to lift them out. When he does that, when he lifts the pearl out of the oyster, he says it's done, he's going to bring us home. That's going to be the rapture. That's going to be the end of the church age. And that point, seven years of Jewish history will start again. They'll go and dig up that treasure because God will never destroy Israel or the Jewish people. He made a promise to Abraham and to his descendants that means for all eternity, for all time. God does not lie. Time I did Minnesota was really bad. <laughs> then there's a, another parable about the wicked vine dressers. There was a, a landowner who planted a vineyard and he turned it over to some people to work on it, to take care of it. And around the time of harvest time, he, you know, the landowner sent his servants to check and see how it's going and basically to get his portion. He didn't want it all, but he wanted his portion. It was due him. And they beat up his servants. They'd send another one. They'd beat him up, stone him. He would, they would kill some of them. So finally the owner said, you know what? I will send my son. They surely will respect him. The son comes and they say, hey, if we kill him, we can take the whole thing. So they kill the son. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the owner of the land is going to do to these wicked people? Remember, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees when he talks about this parable. And they answer him and say, he's going to take that vineyard away from them. And Jesus says, exactly! You are the wicked people. 
I'm going to take what I called you to do, and I'm going to give it to another nation, one that loves me and will do what I ask. A nation of many tongues and kindreds of people, the church. And again, it's only temporary. Colossians 1, 25 and 27, Paul is talking, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That word fulfill is Greek pleroma, which means to complete. He was, Paul was basically told he needs to complete the word of God with the mystery that's been hidden from ages, from generation, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now just imagine, you're Paul. You've been shipwrecked numerous times. You've been beat. You've been stoned and left for dead. You've been bit by a serpent. You're on your way to Rome. And God's already revealed to him what's going to happen. He knows he's going to be to die. And that's nothing. That's nothing compared to the pressure you spend. When God comes and taps him on the shoulder, Paul, you to finish the word of God. I want you to fulfill the word, to complete what is missing. So it's like God came up with this cup. This is the word of God. First, you have Moses. Moses writes the first five books of the Bible. Pretty good, good portion of it. Then along comes Joshua. He writes a couple more. Then you got David and Solomon writing the poetic books. Okay, and then you got the major and minor prophets. So they continue to fill. This is, remember this class is the word of God. When they're all done, it's still not full. Now God has handed this class to Paul. and says, I want you to complete it. I want you to fill it up. Because of the new dispensation, the dispensation of mystery of which we're in, whole new rules had to be made. And because of that, the epistles were written. Not the four Gospels, not the first chapter in Acts. That's all still part of the law. That's before Jesus ascended into heaven, before the day of Pentecost. The mystery, the church, begins on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And it continues from that point on all the way up to Revelation 3. Revelation 3 is the last time you hear of the church. Revelation 4, it's in heaven. That's where we are at that point. Revelation 4 is the rapture of the church. But that kind of pressure on Paul is like, yeah, I got a lot of pressure on me just doing what I'm doing now. You know, the thought of, uh, of doing these seminars, of planting a church. Uh, it could be a lot of pressure. It could be pretty scary, but it's nothing compared to, to Paul. That pressure to know, knowing that he's been tasked with completing the Word of God, the meat for us, our dispensation. Here's what's let me tell you what's included in the mystery. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I must go away so that I can send the Holy Spirit to you. And when he comes, he will be with you forever and he will be in you. Now when it says he will be with you, that's present tense. Remember, when Jesus is talking, this is before the day of Pentecost. That's now. At the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, for the first time, entered and lives within us. That was never heard of in the Old Testament. As good as things were for some of those, the prophets, the priests, the kings, they had the Holy Spirit with them, but never in them. Individual priesthood of every believer. It says, you are now a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a unique people, that you show forth the praises of God. 1 Peter 2.9 before this time, God had one tribe, the Levites, who were the priests for Israel. His original intention 
was for the entire nation of Israel to be a nation of priests. But when Moses was up on Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, what did Israel do? They turned back to their old ways. How quickly they fall. Made their idols, went back to the idol worship, wanted to go back to Egypt. Moses came down and he basically, God had him ask, you know, those that are for God can stand over here, everybody else stand over there. Only the tribe of Levi came and stood over here. So God made them the priests. That's the way it was in the entire Old Testament. Is you had one nation of priests, or one tribe, when, it, when God wanted the whole nation. But after the mystery, after Jesus came and was seated at the, whole, at the right hand of the Father in the Pentecost game, the mystery started, and every believer, every one of us is a priest. Every one of us can go before God as a priest. Because only a priest can go before God and confess sins. What does 1 John say? 1 John says that if we confess our sins, He is just and right to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means we're a priest. I had that against the Catholic Church. I am former Catholic. My wife is former Catholic. Most of my family are still Catholics. I love Catholics. There are a lot of loving people in there, but in this aspect, they've really got it wrong. Because they believe that you have to go to their special priest to confess. Even before I got saved, I always questioned to me. Of course, you know, that was more of a rebellious thing, but still, I believe it was God showing me these things. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, you had the, the kings, the priests, um, the prophets. They all got glimpses, but none of them got what we have today. Every, every, every has the ability to have the influence of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Spiritual gifts for every believer. That means every single believer today can operate in every gift there is. Healing, prophecy, all of it. It's available to all of us. God is not a uh, respecter of persons. We're all equal to Him. We're all His children. He loves us all equally. And some of us can be spoiled brats. Some of us do, you know, need a time out in the corner. <laughs> but God still loves us. That's the whole neat thing about this. The church, never before in the history of the world, was the church. Only after the day of Pentecost did the church begin. That's when Jesus started to build, our, build his church. And then the new birth. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. I want to just take a moment here to talk to you who are watching this video. If you are trusting in anything other than Jesus for your salvation, you're in big trouble. It's real simple. God made it easy. You, know, you may say, well, I'm not as bad as Joe Blow. Well, the problem is, to God, all your good works are nothing but filthy rags because you're an orange. And Joe Blow is an orange. Now, Joe Blow may be a slightly sour orange in you, but you know what? There's a sweet orange in you, but you're still an orange. God wants apples. He said in his word that we're the apple of his eye, those who believe. And only God can take an orange and make it an apple. When you accept Jesus Christ, if you become part of him, when you believe in him, and that's all you do is believe, you become a new creature you become an apple. And you're the apple of God's eye. There's nothing hard about it. There's nothing you have to do. Don't listen to anybody who tells you, well, first you've got to do this. First you've got to change your life. Or you have to do this. Or you have to do that. No. The Bible says, whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It does say, whosoever believes in Him and turns away from his sins. Well, doesn't say, whosoever believes in him and goes and gets baptized. Nope. 
Those are all good things. You should do them. But that has nothing to do with your salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God. There's nothing you do to earn it. If you could earn it, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come. But it's only through that freedom that you have that. And you don't have to do anything. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, it says you shall be saved after you repent, after you get baptized. No, no, no. It stops at saved. There's a period there. There's a very important reason. There's a period there. Yes, you should get baptized. I am all for baptism because it shows the world what you did. It's just a testimony. Yes, you should repent of your sins because you need to try to live for God. And you know, your father doesn't like sins, but he does give you an out because he knows you're human. You're going to screw up. That's where 1 John comes in. You confess your sins, he cleanses you. All you got to do is say, Dad, I'm sorry. I screwed up. Guess what? He says, you know what? I love you. Come on home. Now, if you have any questions about salvation, or if you've accepted Christ because of this, I invite you to write me at comeuphereministry at gmail.com. We would love to help you in any way we can. Now to continue, these are the things that are not included in the mystery. The death of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it happened before Pentecost and was prophesied heavily in the Old Testament. How about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Same thing. Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. Now this one's a real, real squeaker. Okay? <laughs> because when he was seated, or just before he was seated, Pentecost hadn't fallen yet. So it's, when he was seated, it's not Pentecost time. Right after he was seated, the Holy Spirit was sent. Then Pentecost. So it's right after he was seated, right hand, mystery began. Relation. Is that part of the mystery? It happened after Pentecost? Nope. Why? Because it happens after the rapture of the church and is widely spoken of in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has a lot of tremendous writings about the tribulation. Zechariah, Joel, Daniel. You can go on and on. Ezekiel, about the tribulation. There's more about the tribulation in the Old Testament than there is in the book of Revelation. How about the Battle of Armageddon? Of course not. It's after the rapture. Uh, it's at the end of the tribulation. If the tribulation is not in the mystery, then definitely that's not. Second coming of Jesus Christ? Nope. Because it happens after the rapture and it's talked about in the Old Testament. Quite a bit. You know the rapture is not mentioned in the Old Testament at all. Because it's a mystery. The church isn't mentioned because it's a mystery. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ is not part of the mystery. It happens after the rapture and it's talked about, prophesied about many books in the Old Testament. So basically, the way you can look at it, if any of that occurs before the day of Pentecost, it is not part of the mystery. If after the rapture, it is not part of the mystery. And that's it for the dispensation of the mystery. Um, do we have any questions? Thursday, I'm going to go into the rapture of the church. I started to do a little bit before, uh, but I really didn't do it justice. One of the things we're going to talk about is the timing of the rapture. There's the biggest confusion about that. I'm going to show you through the Word what I believe and what I believe the Word bears fruit for, bears truth for, of when the rapture is going to happen. 
I'm going to, if you show up on Thursday, I will give you the date and the hour that it's going to happen. <laughs> Just kidding. No man knows the date or the hour. Not even Jesus. You know, so, and there's a lot of people waiting for the rapture to happen. Not people you're thinking about. And not just the church. They're praying for the rapture to happen. You're going to find out more about that on Thursday. Uh, so thank you for coming. I really appreciate your attendance. Um, went a little bit longer than I thought it would. So I ask that, uh, Father, I ask that you would bless them and keep all these people. That you would make your face to shine upon them. Show them your favor and give them your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.